The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the podcast belong solely to the hosts and not the hosts' past, present, or future employers. Hello, everybody. This is Brian. Breaking down security part two of our discussion with Dave Kennedy's this week. We talked last week about offensive security tools and the pluses and minuses of releasing them. And um, we start this week with a very simple question of what tools do you think potentially should not have ever been released? Uh, Ms. Berlin uh, made a comment during the uh, taping of this that she had a friend who uh, had a tool that he wanted to release, but because of potential backlash, decided to not to. So, um, you know, we'll we'll hear some of that, and we'll hear some of the some of Dave's opinion on that. We also talk about uh, Derby Community, how that's being used to create a sense of family at conferences, which. Uh, now, uh, for the most part and for the near future, are going to be mostly online. Uh, I would recommend, if you're at home, working from home in the new in the new normal, which is everyone's calling it, that you, you look out online, uh, stick your head up a little bit, get on Twitter. There's a bunch of companies putting out content. There's a lot of companies putting out videos and trainings. A lot of companies are you know reducing the costs of their trainings. I know Chris Sanders... Uh, has uh, reduced the price of all the trainings on his website. So if you go to uh, Chris Sanders 88 on Twitter, uh, he has some information on that. Uh, We've had him on the show numerous times. Excellent instructor. Definitely want to uh, check out his his curricula if you are interested in getting uh, some additional training or some skills in in that regard. BreakSec will continue. Ms. Berlin and Mr. Betcher, I'm sure, are, uh, as me, uh, are are committed to, you know, trying to uh, create content that um, kind of takes you away from everything that's going on in the world right now. We won't downplay the coronavirus uh, stuff, but we also won't go out of our way to try to uh, mention it. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, at the end of the show here, you'll hear us talk about our Slack. We have a Slack that, uh, you know, a lot of active people. It's actually become more active since the, the work from home has started. Uh, we have a dedicated channel to talking about all things global pandemic illness, but we try to curtail that on the rest of the channel. So if you are tired of looking at the CNNs and all the mainstream medias and Twitter and Facebook and God knows what else. We do have a somewhat of a haven uh, to uh, escape the info sickness or the, the sickness, if you will, and the illness and the, and the discussion of that and to try to create a, a community where we can still talk about security things. We've got people asking questions about uh, logging and, and uh, VPNs and our book club is still going on and uh, I try to post, you know, discussions about training and, and, and tutorials and things in various channels. So please come in and join us. Uh, you can We have instructions at the end of the show for that. So uh, have a great week. Please be safe. Be kind to one another. If you uh, are within six feet of one another, say hello. Thank your neighbor. Thank the people that are, you know, t- giving you food through your takeout or your drive throughs your takeaways. If uh if you're in a country or in a region that still has that. And uh, remember that uh, there are some people out there who aren't as lucky as us working from home. So um, they they deserve more respect than uh, than we're giving them, I think, in, in a, on a normal day. So appreciate everybody for listening and uh, have a great week. So we talked about, like Ms. Berlin, she said she had a friend who didn't release the tool. Um, Dave, do you believe that there's any time when or any tool that you've ever seen where somebody's like, you know, talk and talk and release here. And was there any tool you ever thought, maybe you shouldn't release that one. And if, if, if you're going to call anybody so, out, you know, we, we, we don't have to call anybody out or anything specific. Sure. Yeah. And you know, uh, um, what's interesting about like autosploy, for example, was one of the first tools I ever released called fast track. 
and it was a exploitation framework for getting a remote code execution in a system. And one of the first things I ever did was uh, a autopone system where it would integrate to all before autopone was was ever released. It would pull all the exploits inside a Metasploit. It would port scan a system and automatically select what exploits were applicable to those and try to get shells back. So it was a brute force of exploits, right? Um, and that was the first tool I ever released uh, at ShmooCon. Uh, now right. it had a lot more functionality than that. It would have um, the ability to do uh, SQL injection for remote code execution, and number, uh, MS SQL as a brute forcing, a number of other techniques, but it was just kind of a small you know, thing that it would typically do. Sorry for the background noise here. My wife is apparently printing a printer. Uh, one second. <laughs> hey. All right, I, I, got, I got to text her really quick here and say no more printing. Hang on. By God, she can do um, whatever she wants. She is an awesome no, it's lady. it's fine. Oh my God. She we can fantastic. we can add Dave's printer to the podcast bingo. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but uh, yes. uh, one one thing I'll say is that uh, you know you, you, there are there are tools that 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 have things like zero days in them, right? And and I don't agree with that. I think that if there's a way to fix an issue with a vulnerability, you should do it. Um, right. and, and you should work with that company to fix it. But if there's things like command and control infrastructure that helps the red team, that helps people actually do adversary emulation and test the effectiveness of companies, I think that is absolutely viable. Again, I don't condone what the, the verbiage or the language of the CDC was back then, the call to the cows back then, when they were like, hey, you know, do this or do that. But it was effective in changing the times of what they did. You know, Microsoft wasn't paying attention to security those, those periods of time, and they changed very substantially and were better off because of it. We have ASLR and data execution prevention and stack canaries. We have all these abilities to really make exploit different. A good example, I remember writing one of the first exploits uh, for return-oriented program at the time. It wasn't called ROP gadgets at, at the time. And it, would take me, it took me about a week and a half to build this exploit that was off of SL mail at the time. It was an offensive security and ended up becoming one of their modules. And it took me about two weeks to basically write this module and to get around data execution prevention it took me about two weeks. And there wasn't a lot of documentation. There was a Frack magazine article from, I think, Egypt at the time. And, uh, and what ended up happening was, you know, Microsoft was like, whoa, you could basically bypass all of our ways of doing buffer overflows. And now we're going to do a lot of protection around that. They came up with M at the time and the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit. Toolkit. They built that a lot into the Windows uh, 10 operating system. They really made the operating system substantially more secure because of that research that happened. So again, we are better off today from a technology perspective because of the research that happened. But there is absolutely the case to be made for collateral damage. Again, are we better off now? I believe so. Was there collateral damage that happened before in the past? Yes. Uh, but we are better off because of it. Right. Dave, I think these vendors, um, whenever they have the choice of just putting out a crappy signature or actually fixing yep. their tool or things like that, I think it all comes down to money. And I've actually seen cases where I believe that they do not make their tool better in order to sell services, right? So have you seen that and, and what's your take on that? Yeah, it, it really comes down to the company and the pressure that they get, right, uh, for, for what they're seeing. I think that uh, uh, most companies try to do the right thing, uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, a, it's a time risk perspective of how much money it's going to cost to actually address it and what you're able to do. We actually are running into an issue right now uh, with a company where we did a pen test for an organization uh, and we found a zero day for an, an application. And, um, you know, we have NDAs with our customers uh, and we don't have NDAs with that third party that we tested, right? And so we notified the third party of the zero day of what we found, but the company itself is trying to bury it, basically saying, you cannot have your third party release this information. Uh, and we want you to tell this company while you're under NDA that you're not allowed to release, release this information because it will be damaging to our company. And obviously, we want to create a CVE, make sure that everybody's addressed with it. They do their appropriate patching. Uh, and they're not allowing us to accomplish that. Now we're looking at ways of, of trying to kind of look around that uh, legal ways of, of, of trying to help others out with it. But you run into companies all the time that, that do not address problems in their organization and they rather just kind of move down the road. And, and, and you, there, there needs to be a mechanism for trying to help others out. There needs to be a mechanism for forcing those organizations 
to really address their security program uh, problems that they have um, within their companies. And I think, you know, the, the, the methods that we have with CVEs releasing zero days, if they don't uh, specifically address it over a 60, 90 day period, um, you know, for us specifically, I mean, if a company says, listen, it's going to take us a year and a half to fix this vulnerability. Cool. Got it. I understand it's a really complex situation. You might not have the time and effort to do it. Can we track this as we go along? But we'll wait a year and a half before we actually go and do it because it's the best interest for everybody else out there. Um, but if you completely blow us off, ignore us, we need to force you to figure out a way to, to address these exposures out there to make the world a better place again. And that is very important, I think, for this industry, for making technology better, for holding companies accountable. Uh, when you do IT, when you do IoT, when you do new new technology products, you have to have a responsibility around security and addressing your own your own home. Dave, would uh, would having clauses in your contracts discussing like we discovered in O Day, um, maybe it's in a in a in a vendor that they're using, like let's say, I'm not not trying to you know make put it out there but you know Cisco comes up with some you know fairly good humdingers here uh if you found something in that uh do you have language in your contracts with your customers to say okay there's an no day in this Cisco kit and we need to disclose that to Cisco do you have do you have those kinds of clauses in there we, we do but but traditionally what we have done is we have um uh, let the customer determine whether or not we can communicate that uh, out to the public. Because what we view um, our assessment is, is the intellectual property of the customer itself. And this is actually the first time where we've had a customer say, listen, please don't disclose this because my third party is pissed at me if I do. And so in that case, you know, we have to look at it from a not pissing off our customer, but at the same time trying to help others that may have the same software uh, incorporated in their environment. And so I think we're going to look at revising our legal language and say, listen, you know, if we find a zero day in your environment, we will hold the third party accountable and we will eventually publish this as a CV so that others can track it to understand what risk and exposures they have as well. We not, might not publish the exploit code, but we will def definitely publish the CV. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important for companies to, to think about. Right. Would it help to get a third party, get involved with the with the third party, with the software vendor? In other words, to anonymize both you and your clients? You mean like a broker or something? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem you run into is that, that you know, with the current language, our, our NDAs basically bind us to that customer uh, for its intellectual property. So we can't really reach out to a third party to disclose that information unless the third party customer is is involved in that that discussion, right? And currently the third party customer is being strong armed by the software vendor that provides all that software that's integral to their business that, that, you know, they're concerned that it might hurt their position in the company from a security perspective um, based off of that. So it's a it's really interesting political dilemma um, that we're currently involved in. Now, you know, granted, we're not going to release the code uh, in any way, should perform to get remote code ex execution things that we're not going to put harm to people, but we want to hold the software vendor um, liable. Uh, as well as, as accountable to fixing the issues that they have there and ensuring that all their customers get those so others can't actually go and exploit that. And I think that's really important. And uh, that's why I think we'll, we'll do definitely a shift in our, in our language where we own uh, the ability to contact directly as well as uh, release the information around that regardless of the third-party customer as part of our master service agreement. That's good, yeah. Um, let's see... So Dave, um, keeping in mind that today's problems are yesterday's solutions, for example, you go all the way back to uh, DLL side loading, to WMI, to PowerShell. Um, what's next on the horizon here? What do you see as the next um, like Graber memory injection technique type thing? <laughs> you know, I, I still think that... Um, uh, C Sharp and .NET are still a viable exploitation method for most companies. Um, the integration into detection is, is, is very recent, still kind of coming through. So I think, you know, you still have a very long um, exploitation path for that. Where like I the think- The compile on the fly type stuff? Yeah, like deserialization techniques, uh, the ability to use any type of C Sharp code to get remote code execution, leveraging living off the of land binders and scripts. 
you know, it's interesting because I do a lot of speaking around the world and I'll actually ask, like, can they get a raise of hands who's detecting living off the land binders and scripts? And I rarely get one person in the audience that actually says, yes, I'm doing that. And so, you know, you look at that attack surface, you say, well, we still have a long ways to go uh, as far as that's concerned. We're honestly see most of the area of opportunity from an attacker's perspective is going back to the lower level programming languages like C and C++. Most organizations have very little detection for remote code execution in the lower level programming languages. And honestly, most of our C, C++ stagers completely go undetected in every capacity, regardless if you're using an EDR product uh, or antivirus product itself. Um, so I see lower level programming uh, languages and going back to the exploits of, of traditional 90s and, and 2000, early 2000 exploits as being very viable uh, for most organizations from a, a uh, uh, lack of detection perspective. Right. So what's old is new again. That's absolutely right. So one of the, before we move along, if unless we have more questions, uh, there was one uh, that I I saw later on after with the with the whole Twitter thing, and I don't mean to bring it back to that, but uh, a friend of the show he he helps out with uh, hack the box. He's got some awesome YouTube videos on how to hack the uh, the hack the box stuff once they've been released. IppSec. He said, uh, to people upset by red team tools, if you can't detect an open source tool, then what chance do you have at detecting private one-off tools? It's much easier to automate a battle against 100 duck-sized horses than it is to face off against a single horse-sized duck. Um, the reason I, po- I put that one in was I was like, yes, if you can't detect what's already publicly known, how are you going to, you know, it, it would be impossible to detect what is private. So, um, Dave, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I think a, a public disclosure of, of tools um, allows companies that have an already established security program to be able to effectively detect those. The problem we run into, and, and this is where I agree with with Andrew's points, a number of other folks that are on the opposite side, is that what do you do from a, a company perspective where you have organizations that don't have those capabilities, that, that have one person dedicated to security or not anybody at all? And, and, and so you look at it and you say, well, there's a large percentage that don't have the full capabilities out there. And that's, that's really where you have to have a, a shift, I think, in the industry where if you're doing business in IT, you have to have a security component for that. And it's gross negligence if you don't. Um, and so my, my opinion is things like the MITRE attack framework as a, as a great example. You know, they map over uh, was you know several hundred uh, techniques that map down to several thousand subcategories of techniques. Um, that's an overwhelming uh, thing to accomplish in an organization, but those techniques are, are things that have already been publicly disclosed that you can start to build detections for that ha- have a, a large percentage of, of efficiency around looking at that. And that's where I really have a, a problem right now with this industry uh, is that we, we are solely focused on looking at very specific signatures, whether it's command line arguments, persistence, lateral movements, we look for signatures of things that have already happened. Why are we not looking at the behavior that they exhibited? You know, why is PowerShell uh, communicating out to the internet in the first place? Yes, we're going to have false positive, but can we baseline normal traffic and then look for deviations of those? You know, we have to be in a, in a model of, of the constant mindset of threat hunting where we're looking for already established communi- command and control infrastructure. We're looking for command line arguments that are unusual. Why is Bob and Sales not executing PowerShell? Why is Bob and Sales not executing command line argument? You know, we have to look more at the behavior of things that are exhibiting out there than we can rely on our specific tools. I would tell you that I don't care what EDR product you're using. I don't care what antivirus product you're using. If I modify or change my code in some way, shape or form, I'm pretty much escaping what you're doing, uh, what you're doing today. And, and that is absolutely a problem, right? Uh, we need to be focusing more on the behavior of things, uh, dedicating people to be able to actually identify them and really focusing on, on trying to make the industry better based on behavior techniques than it is looking for specific signatures. And, and, and to my opinion, uh, you know, if, if a tool disclosure completely jacks up your entire security program, you're doing security wrong. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Um, Ms. Berlin, Mr. Betcher, any other questions? Mm-mm. Okay. Um, I do want to discuss a couple things uh, happened within the last uh, last few weeks. Uh, well, this one's actually happened just shortly after uh, DerbyCon ended. You created something called DerbyCom or Derby Communities, um, and apparently it's been 
kicking off like gangbusters. There's just tons of folks getting involved. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is all about, considering I'm also a conference organizer and, you know, was thinking about maybe hooking up with DerbyCon, but, you know, not really understanding everything? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, we are recruiting for help. So if you want to help organize uh, the overall DerbyCon communities, I can use help because it's just me right now. Okay. Uh, and, and I'm very effing busy. So uh, I'm, I'm behind on going through all the submissions uh, right now. So I apologize for anybody that submitted a DerbyCon submission in the past month or so uh, because I've just like literally been des- like destroyed. Um, but one thing that DerbyCon uh, was supposed to do is, is that, you know, I heard from people and I hear it every, literally every single week, uh, that DerbyCon was something special, right? Um, that when we went to the conference, it was a family feel. Everybody was welcome. You know, things changed drastically because of DerbyCon. Now, whether it was, you know, uh, the mental health village, uh, you know, Ooh, whether it was, right. um, you know, new conferences spawning because of it, whether it was uh, just the, you know, people feeling welcome and inclusive, it was all for everybody. And, um, and people wanted to reciprocate that entire thing, uh, you know, in different areas. And so when we ended DerbyCon, uh, we created DerbyCon communities, which is a way for you as an individual to get the same type of feel that you experienced there to light that spark um, to create other local communities, whether it's a forum, a, lo- a local chapter, whether it's a conference, uh, whether it's a kids and community event, um, the ability for you to help your own individual area, very similar to what B-Sides has been able to do, uh, but in different forums, uh, in different locations. And so you can go to the derbycon.com website, you can apply to become a uh, DerbyCon family and you can and you can get the support from myself basically running this all right now, um, but to get uh, sponsors, to get money, to help you create your own events, uh, to really try to replicate what what DerbyCon was was all about. You know, we raise more money every year for charity than DEF CON and Black Hat combined. Um, you know, we, we really focused on helping others uh, bringing new people into indus- into the industry, uh, trying to get people their career started. Matthew Graber is a great example. Matthew Graber got his career started at DerbyCon. Uh, Matthew Graber came up to me personally. He's like, "Hey, I'm new to this. I came from you know the, this military branch. I'm looking at, at kind of breaking out. What do you recommend?" And I sat with Matthew Graber for you know an hour, and lo and behold, he becomes Matthew Graber. And so, you know, you want to be able to spawn and foster new people coming to the industry to, to make this industry a better place. And uh, DerbyCon was really started to, to really foster that, to help others create what we were able to accomplish at, at DerbyCon itself. Cool. So um, as, a, as a conference organizer, maybe I'm you know new and I don't understand what's going on and I'm listening to break second. I go, ooh, that's something I want to do. How, how would somebody get involved with the Derby Com, Derby communities? Uh, is there a submission plan? Do yep. I have to do a marketing plan or something? Well, what we recommend is that you go to derbycon.com and you can apply to become a new, either a chapter, uh, which is more of like a, a frequent meeting, whether it's weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly, whatever. It's more of a group get together where we all share our experiences and try to make things better. Um, a, a conference where you actually want to start a new conference um, or a kids and community where, you know, it's more teaching kids in our next generation, yeah. but you can apply for that. And we're not asking for a marketing plan. What we're asking for you is to, is to understand your vision of what you want to accomplish. Um, can, you know, do, do what do you want to do to make this industry better? And we validate those. And if you have a good proposal of like, Hey, we want to help others learn about information security. You get approved and we help you out. You join a whole other community. There's a Slack channel dedicated to other people doing the same, same thing. We're all sharing as a community to help each other uh, kind of grow. And it's, it's, it's very much a collaboration. If you don't know what you're doing, we'll help you out. Um, there's so many great people willing to, to kind of take it to the next step and, and kind of expand this for, for a greater purpose. That's amazing. Yeah, I was I, I was glad to see that uh, was going to continue to live on in some form or fashion because uh, that was the first conference I ever went to. Uh, my, you know, I, I've been to B sides, but at the time it was very very small and whatever. This was like on the same level of us. Like, well, I couldn't go to DefCon and Black Hat, but I could go to DerbyCon. And you know, if Mr. Betcher went, I think the year before, and I hadn't got a chance to go because he's gone to he went to four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. I just went to five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, and yeah, he was like, oh, it was so great. I'm like, oh, I've got to go this year. So, um, yeah. First My time first I... Derby Cannon was terrible, but oh, <laughs> after, that it was, after that, it was great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everything else I've been to just doesn't have that same, you know, same level, the same panache, you know, that, that same little 
that energy you get when you when you're done. It's just not the same as when, the DerbyCon. When, our 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 goal with DerbyCon is is people don't understand the amount of planning that goes into a conference like that. And it is literally six or seven of us that are just great friends building a conference. And we want the whole feel to be like, it is you helping build that conference and, and helping others make it a community event. And, and when I say it's six or seven of us, it's really probably 200 of us really building that conference, right? Everything from the staff, the events, the training, the security, all that stuff that goes involved. That's everybody contributing for free, for free. They're giving their right. own time in life that, that, you know, that, that they can't get back again to make something special because they believe in, in, in the mission that you're doing. And, you know, we started DerbyCon, we started in a pizza shop, you know, we're like, this right. is awesome. Let's, let's try to do this. And, and we were hoping to break even. And if it, we didn't, I would have lost a second mortgage on my house. I literally would have to do a second mortgage on my house to, to make DerbyCon 2 successful. Luckily, DerbyCon 1 was, was wildly successful. We didn't have to do that. But it's taking those risks. It's, it's, it's trying to help others. And it's really trying to make the community better. And, and, and people will argue there's no community. There's absolutely community. There's, there's different communities working on different things. There are different people trying to help others. Um, regardless of what that community is, it's all of us trying to make information security a place that's welcoming for everybody, that tries to help others, that tries to help others in need, um, and, and, and tries to make a world a better place. And, and that is what this community is about. That's what DerbyCon was about. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah, a lot of good memories at DerbyCon. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was fantastic. Uh, if if you've missed out, what? so I'm going to Circle City Con in June. I've heard that that one's very good. Um, it, it almost like she need to have two to you know, replace DerbyCon. So uh, I'm going to do Circle City Con and maybe 614 Con and that one next year. I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll see what happens. It, uh, need, to, need to come to NOLACon. That's pretty good too. Oh, NOLACon, yeah. Um, I, I actually really enjoy Anolacon. Uh, it definitely has a family feel. I'll be there myself. I'm speaking. Um, I am a huge fan of Anolacon as well. Wild West Hacking Fest is another great conference. Yep. Um, I haven't done this the 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 California one. I try to stay away from California like the plague. But uh, but uh, the the <laughs> <laughs> none wrong with San Diego, <laughs> man. None wrong. Yeah, but uh, the the uh, the um, the Deadwood one is really phenomenal, and John and his team at Black Hills do a phenomenal job there at, at creating a great uh, ecosystem for friends. Um, but uh, yeah, those are the, the the two or three that I've really honed in. And Circle City is a phenomenal conference as well. That's cool. So um, before we let you go, uh, there was another tweet uh, that that came out, and you talked about. Uh, the Dave Kennedy Center for Gaming and Leadership, and you, uh, this is in your your city of uh, Bedford there. So uh, tell us a little bit about how that came about. I mean, how do you just get your name put on something unless you gave them, you know, fat stacks of cash? <laughs> Funny story. Um, so uh, I really try to donate as much as I possibly can to charities, um, to helping others, um, to making people better, uh, because I understand that not everybody has a, 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 a the same experience that I had, I guess, in life. And, you know, when I look at my life, I, I was very, um, not to get all deep, but I had, I had a, a set of great parents. They were just phenomenal uh, parents growing up. They're always supportive of me. They were absolutely amazing. Um, they divorced at a young age, but they still stayed together and, and, you know, for the, for the best of me, but they were very much on the lower income side. Uh, we moved from city to city to city um, based on the job that they were taking, um, you know, there was bankruptcies involved there, you know, just, you know, came up from a very, um, lower income type of family. And, and it's not, not a, a embarrassing situation. They did everything they possibly could to, to give me the best education possible, to give me the best life possible. They were great parents. Um, and one of the, the places that I, I actually ended up graduating from was, was Bedford high school and uh, Bedford High School, their average medium income is under thirty thousand mm. uh, dollars, which was substantially lower than the the average income for every state in the United States. And um, you know, Bedford is a, a they have some great teachers there. I remember Mrs. Peterson, my accounting teacher, would always yell at me because I was mudding and coding in the middle of her class in accounting. You know, Mrs. Dean is literally the only reason I I graduated high school. I almost failed out of high school to pass, and she 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 took a, a shot at me to to get me through. And, um, you know, I have been very successful in my careers with multiple businesses, you know, kind of coming up through the Marine Corps. And then from there, kind of starting off, I, 
most people don't know this, but when I got out of the Marine Corps, I lived with my mom for a number of months with my wife at the time. She wasn't my wife at the time, but my girlfriend at the time, Aaron. And then we ended up getting a small apartment complex in North Royalton and kind of growing my career from there. So I started from nothing to, to something. And um, what I really wanted to do was, was give something back to, to Bedford. And, uh, you know, gaming uh, was very much negatively looked upon uh, when I was a kid growing up, even though I gamed substantially. And that's, I, I, I really credit a lot of my early programming skills and everything else to, to gaming. Um, but it's, it's completely different today. And I'm on the board of technology for Bedford high schools. And they, they were looking at creating a gaming center for, for children to give them scholarship opportunities there. And Bedford is not known for being a very technologically advanced, uh, uh, school district. And I really wanted to, to figure out a way to help kids that are in similar situations as me, um, in a, a low poverty, um, type of, of wage to, to help them out. And so I donated a substantial amount of money as well as guidance and structure, um, to, to create a, a state-of-the-art gaming center. And what we also did is we partnered with the Cleveland Cavaliers and their esports team. We partnered with a number of uh, Notre Dame here in Cleveland, a number of other ones to help provide scholarship opportunities uh, for, for kids uh, so that they can actually get scholarship opportunities for gaming, computers, uh, understanding technology, giving them opportunities that they never had before. And that was really important for me. I don't, I don't care about the name, to be perfectly honest with you. It's, it's, it's very humbling. It's very amazing that it occurred that they, they named it after me. But at the same time, I know that there's kids that are going to have a, a, a chance in life that they never would have had before in the first place. And people that, that aren't necessarily good with sports. I wasn't great with sports. You know, there's a kid there with multiple sclerosis um, that is one of the top kids on the team that is, that is just killing it from an esports perspective. And they have the camaraderie that they have between other kids where I remember, you know, a kid with multiple sclerosis would have been picked on his entire life, you know, through that. Then now that he is a team camaraderie piece, you're changing people's lives. And, and that's what it's all about. I, I want to leave this world uh, to be a, a, a better place than when I left it. And I really saw this as an opportunity. And, and believe me, I'm not done with this one. Um, I want to build this out. I want to make it successful. And I want to model this for other schools and help other schools out, um, start to build this out so that they can give other kids opportunities that they wouldn't ever, ever had uh, in their entire life. That's fantastic. That's, that's, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, you're, you're giving a, you're giving somebody a, a chance they may never have had. That's, uh, that, that's great. Especially when you can, if they could look back and, you know, know that you helped them out. So um, Dave, you've got, uh, you've got a fair sized organization. Are you, um, perhaps hiring for <laughs> positions? You know, somebody might be looking for a job. Uh, what, what, what kind of things are you looking for in, uh, right now? Well, for, for right now, uh, at binary defense, we are pretty much always hiring. Uh, I think we're double the size now of trust at SAC, which we have, we have grown, uh, leaps and bounds over that side and just doing some amazing things from, uh, a monitoring detection perspective, software development. We're looking for Python programmers, we're looking for F sharp and C sharp developers. Um, we're looking for security uh, analysts and SOC uh, analysts. Uh, we're looking for threat hunters. Uh, you, you name it. We're, we're looking for pretty much everything on that side. At Trusted Sec, we're a little bit more tight laced uh, when we come to it. We, we usually hire based off of recommendations of folks that we know. Uh, we have a sales position open right now, but we're actually um, going to be uh, opening up shortly for more junior and internship programs. We just promoted somebody uh, that I've been a good friend with, uh, Jason Ashton, that ran our sound and audio over at uh, DerbyCon, uh, works at Trusted Sec. And uh, I just promoted him to the uh, principal security consultant of training and development, uh, which we're gonna be hiring uh, new, new juniors, um, new interns from different schools uh, to help grow them in their next profession, whether that's at Trusted Sec or other organizations really give them the opportunity of kind of growing. So that'll be coming out soon. We're going to open up a number of positions there. Uh, we're going to be having a, a few positions open soon on the senior side around penetration testers, red teamers, um, uh, application security, uh, and uh, research. So uh, definitely keep posted on the, the trust sex site. Uh, we post them. And honestly, to be perfectly frank with everybody here, we usually give around, we usually get around 200 applicants, if not more per position. Um, so we actually go through all those, uh, we, we monitor them. Um, but you know, if you, you, you know, us, you're friends with us, you've gotten to, to, to work with us on a, on a different basis. You obviously have a upper hand for those. Um, but we appreciate everybody that submits there. It's a pretty incredible experience to get such a amazing, overwhelming, uh, uh, submission for those types of, 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 of positions that we have. And we, we, I wish I could hire everybody. Uh, but, uh, at the same time, we got to look at what's best for that position, what's best for the culture, 
uh, what's best for the long-term events of, of trusted tech. And uh, we kind of go through there. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, it's good to hear, uh, it's good to hear you're, uh, you're having the problem of not, you know, you're having too many people apply for jobs instead of not enough. So I want to hire y'all seriously. I, I wish I could hire everybody. <laughs> right on. Um, well, Mr. Mr. Betcher, Ms. Berlin, we don't get Dave on all that often. Is there anything else you'd like to ask before we go? We're, we're at the top of the hour, but, uh, the way everything is going to work out, I've lost a couple of minutes of audio. So we'll, d- I'll explain that in post. <laughs> I explained that in post, so don't worry about it. <laughs> so, uh, Dave, you got any stock options? <laughs> <laughs> just to our employees, just to our employees, unfortunately, at this point. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't plan on IPO. You know, uh, what's interesting is, uh, you know, I started Trusted Sec from the basement of my house. Um, you know, I, I, I took a career jump. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to start a company in the basement of my house, and I think it can be successful. I, I hope that everybody takes that jump that that tries to do something on their own because it is an amazing opportunity. I, I would have never guessed. Uh, actually, Aaron and I were talking just just together, and if if you would have said that you know we would employ over three hundred people, you know, between the companies, you know that 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 would be something obtainable. We would have looked at you like you're crazy, and you know, chase your goals, chase your dreams, you know, do things methodically, but you know, at the same time, keep it family. Um, I just did a disc profile. Is anybody familiar with disc? Yeah, oh, yeah, D-I-S-C, yeah. right? And so D is also known as the dick, uh, you know, uh, you know, and then, you know, but it's, you know. Very um, aggressive. More, very aggressive, you know, and, and and you have the I and the S, which is more inclusive of everybody, um, want to make it a family feel. I am polar opposite to the right on the I and the S. Like I'm balanced right in the middle of the I and S where I want everybody to be family. I want everybody to be friends. I don't want conflict. You know, which you look at all CEOs, they're like far D's, you know, they're like far left over here. Right. And uh, for me, I, I just want a place that I can work at where I can call everybody, my friends that I, they, they know that I would do everything for them, whether it's health, family, you know, personal sanity, that I would do anything for them uh, to make that possible. And whether or not that's the best successful model for business, I don't really care. I just want to enjoy me going to work and, and loving life uh, for, for the people I work with and, 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 and making sure that the, what we're doing is the best for the people that we're doing the work for. And uh, honestly, that is, that is all I get out of, out of doing these companies. I enjoy every minute of it. And uh, you know, it's, it's a family thing for me. It's not a, a making money thing. Granted, you know, I, very, I live a very great life and I'm very, very blessed for that. Um, but at the same time, I look at it as, as I'm helping others. And uh, so we're probably not going to be IPOing any soon or asking for any stock options or anything like that. Uh, but at the same time, I look forward to hiring everybody in this world that wants to, to be a family friendly uh, organization that wants to help others, that wants to be inclusive for everybody else and uh, wants to make a world a better place. So I'm going to take over the world someday. I just hope it's sooner than later. So <laughs> nice. Um, cool. All right. So Dave, uh, if uh, people wanted to, you know, continue that conversation potentially towards, uh, employment, how would they, uh, how would they find you? So you can find me at Twitter at hacking Dave. Um, you can also find at trusted sec at binary underscore defense. Uh, we also have a job recruitment area on the trustedsec.com website and on the binary defense website. Cool. All right. Um, Ms. Berlin, tell everybody about your extracurriculars and what you're doing. Um, let's see here. I'm not going to any conference in March. Yay! <laughs> uh, but uh, we'll be training at NOLACON. So please sign up for my training. So we have more than three people. Um, and Can I sign up? Yes. It All is right. so much fun. You, you would have a blast. It's like d and it's, uh, it's what we did for um, besides Cleveland last year, but now we turned it from four hours to two days so it's <laughs> all awesome. t- all tabletop exercises hands-on and then like let, yeah just D D. so you get to roll into uh different groups and uh you know you could be anything from a CISO to help desk to a lawyer and yeah. it's super fun check out higher. amanda is an amazingly brilliant person even though she she won't admit it to me um, she is awesome nope. at what she does. I re- highly recommend her training. Yes. There you go. Tell everybody everywhere. <laughs> can I, can I use my IT help desk plus five Vorpal ethernet cable or something? Can I, can I have that? My- uh, you have to roll for it. Oh crap. 
I, I everyone don't... and and we're having these custom dice towers made oh, that are really super cool so and awesome. everybody gets their own dice that's fantastic nice. mm-hmm. so to find out about all that fun how would they find you uh at info sister i-n-f-o-s-y-s-t-i-r or at infosec roleplay all right and uh hackers health and hackers health that's we're doing one. lots of stuff i i'm getting i i am successfully completing my 2020 uh resolutions which it means amanda's delegating more yes excellent I actually wore your uh, purple Hacker's Health t-shirt to the lecture Ugh, yesterday. Again, we were talking about t-shirts earlier. They're so comfortable. I know. They feel so nice. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, Mr. Betcher, how about you? What 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 is it that you do that makes you special other than, than you know, giving me your time and effort for the show? My kids. Uh, no, really. Uh, <laughs> what makes me special? Well, um my day job fighting, fighting the bad guys all day. And then I come home, uh, play with the kids and, you know, put everybody to bed and then I'm off uh, coding. Right. Right. So I have this tool called log MD and you can read about it at log dash MD.com. And don't forget to, uh, put the dash in there. Cause if you don't, they'll, you'll get some, um, proctologist in Wisconsin or something. Oh, like that. okay. Let's see a it's a different kind of blog. <laughs> Whitehouse, Whitehouse.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you can find me on Twitter uh, at BetcherPoned, B O E T T C H E R P W N E D, and uh, log MD.com. Right on. So uh, March um, March 4th was our, our monthly CSEC East. By the time this comes out, it will be after March 4th, so it won't matter. I uh, hope everybody had fun. We uh, We sold out. So uh, we had 40 people coming. Uh, I hope everybody showed up and I'm, you know, I'm not lying, but everybody signed up right now. Um, if uh, it's a local meetup here in the Seattle, uh, Bellevue, Redmond area, if you're interested in checking, uh, checking it out for professional networking in the local Seattle area, uh, first Wednesday of every month, you can find us on uh, meetup. Uh, BreakSec uh, podcast can be found on Twitter at BreakSec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. And if, uh, you can follow me, Brian Brake, on Twitter at uh, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. I don't, I don't have a cool hacker name or, you know, Info Sister, Betcher Pwn or anything. It's just, just my name. So um, you can, uh, we will have the uh, CFP for our conference up here in Seattle, InfoSec Campout 2020. It'll be August 28th and 29th and 30th at the same place it was last year if you came. So uh, we're looking forward to doing that. Um, you know, it's it's not extreme camping. The The place we camp is less than a half a mile from a Starbucks. So it's not like you, you, you know, all the necessary bits are still there. Uh, we're trying to, uh, we've got full pow- power, so you can come and charge your Teslas or your RVs or whatever. Um, yeah, no problems there. So we'll, we'll have more information on that, uh, as it, as it happens, we're, uh, making the event bright links and everything now for that, but it'll be August 28th and 29th up here in Seattle. So, you know, start looking at, uh, you know, ticket prices. It's going to be lovely. Um, we are all about building community and family here. We're just not under the Derby Com uh, banner. Um, we're we're looking into that. So uh, we have a Slack as well. I, right? I think th- there's there's someone slacking, uh, not re- replying to your emails. Someone slacking. Yeah, it's probably it's probably me. <laughs> no, I silenced but, uh, mine. What, one thing I say is is one thing we wanted to create with Derby Com is that anybody, regardless of you're you using the Derby Con, uh, uh, representation can join the communities now granted I, again I need help so if anybody wants to help out with management of that like I'll pay you I, I will pay you money uh, you I know. would but I'm trying to get rid of stuff now <laughs> not <laughs> yeah if you, if you if you want to make some money on the side and help out with management like excel skills uh, responding to emails like I would greatly appreciate that uh, that's on no oh, okay there you go cool it's good to I'm know that tempted. there's volunteer oper- uh, opportunities out there. So, um, yeah, so our Slack uh, has been around for a while. Uh, we get a lot of positive feedback from it. Uh, if you're interested in, in joining that, you can send us a DM on Twitter uh, using the BreakSec hashtag, uh, the BreakSec handle, uh, or send us a po- an email to bds.podcast at gmail.com, and uh, we'll, we'll get those back to you. We have a CTF uh 
a club, a book club, which is uh, d- going through the packed publishing book, uh, penetrate, uh, pen testing, uh, AWS environments. And that's, uh, that's, uh, Ben Cottle's book. I forget the, the gentleman, the other gentleman's name, but, um, I think that's everything. Oh, uh, thank you to our patrons every month for donating money that helps with uh, hosting, uh, time and effort of uh, putting out a podcast each week, and the Zoom that we're actually using to record the podcast tonight. So uh, thank you to everybody who uh, helps out with that. And we have a T-Pub store, so if you want to grab some uh, grab some T-shirts or mugs or anything, you can check out the show notes for our T-Pub link, and you can... Uh, uh, yeah, I think Ms. Berlin's face is still on t-shirt over there. So, I was, uh, so I was, I was told I'm supposed to switch the, my face picture with my new headshot. Oh, that's right. You got your headshots. That's right. I saw that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, you can do that. that uh, it's, it's, it's the best, uh, best pictures I've ever gotten after spending 30 minutes in some random dude's basement. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's, that's <laughs> lovely. <laughs> at least you you know you're welcome, he, you're welcome. He, was he going to show you his butterfly collection too or something oh, <laughs> right yeah oh, oh per later anyway so um <laughs> i think i think we're done this week uh we'll be back next week we actually have some uh interesting interviews coming on about uh, schools and ransomware uh so we're uh, we're gonna have those recorded up very soon and uh, you know, come and come and listen to how the other side is with regards to school and IT and infrastructure for security there. So it's going to be, I think it's going to be shocking, quite eye opening for some folks. So um, that was it for this week on breaking down security. Uh, have a great week. Be kind to one another and take care of yourself because you're only you you have. And we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Peace.